purchases of inventory for resale and the year-end inventory, otherwise known as kind of year-end stock, is something that's definitely, definitely going to be uh, in the paper F3 exam in a pretty large way. Um, could be in the context of accounting for um, the year-end valuation of inventory. It could be in the county, the scenario of purchase reconciliation, purchase ledger reconciliation. Let's look initially really at the inventory asset and how we get to an inventory asset in the accounts at the end of the period. Okay, now the first thing is accounting systems can deal with inventory in two different ways. Now in the notes here we've got some double entry journals. It might be quicker just to take a look at this as well in a different, um, different screen. So imagine for example we purchase inventory first of all, and imagine we do that in one day. That therefore means, therefore means we have inventory asset. When we then sell that inventory asset we have a sale well, that is therefore a cost of the sale or cost of sales, of course, because there are many more than one sale during the period. Now, this basically requires two double entry journals. Um, one is the act of purchasing inventory and putting it into inventory asset, and then when it comes out of the inventory asset, putting it into a cost of sales. So that involves recognising an asset before that asset is de-recognised, because if you've obviously sold the inventory to a customer, the inventory then belongs to them. Now, if we were to do that, and let's say, for example, you've got you know, 100,000 units uh, purchased during the period, and you've sold 98,000 units, that's an awful, awful lot of double-entry bookkeeping. And for most businesses that have a fairly high volume of fairly, uh, high volume of fairly low value inventory, that would really create a tremendous amount of work. The basically simplification is this, that you say we purchase inventory, and because we very much expect any individual item of inventory to be sold by the year end, we anticipate the sale at the point when we actually buy the inventory. In other words, we treat that basically as an expense in profit or loss, and we completely bypass the inventory asset account. Now, both of those things work. This is literally just debit cost of sales. Now, most of the time we say debit purchases, but purchases is part of cost of sales. So when we produce our accounts at the end of the period, anything that's on our purchases tier account is going to get written off to cost of sales. So the effect is to say, as we've got in green on screen here, purchase inventory is just debit uh, cost of sales and credit cash or payables, however we accounted for it. Now, of course, at the year end, this means that our cost of sales is overstated because of the fact if we stick with the same figures that I've got here, we purchased 100,000 units and we sold 98,000 units. So the question is, how much is my inventory? Well, Quite simply, I don't know. I know that it's going to be something up to 2,000 units, but it's entirely possible that it's an awful lot less than that because of the fact that you can have theft, you can have breakages, and a whole range of other things that cause stock shrinkage. Typically, stock shrinkage is going to be, it depends where you are in the world, but you're looking at 1 or 2% if you're a retailer of your inventory is just going to disappear because of breakages and theft. And I say that is a very variable figure around the world, but that is kind of the information I've seen that's a typical sort of figure. So in other words, if you have this thing in blue, this kind of constant inventory system, where in theory you'd be able to kind of get your accounting system to, to tell you what your inventory inventory is at any stage, it won't be right. You're actually still going to have to go and physically count that inventory because if you bought 100,000 units, you sold 98,000 units, it could well be that you've got absolutely nothing left because the other 2,000 units just went into somebody's pocket as they left without paying. Okay, so you can't show something as an asset if it's not there. So even if we're using the system in blue, and some companies do, um, the companies that use the system in blue at the top of the screen here of recording an inventory account, I'll just show how this will be recorded by the way, that's basically debit inventory asset. We've got this on the, uh, the course notes and credit uh, cash or payables in this situation with 100,000. And then when we actually make each sale, we're recording that as credit inventory and debit cost of sales. Well, that might work if you've got fairly small volume of high value inventory. Let's say you're a car dealer or something. That, that is well worth the effort because of the fact that you want to know what your inventory is at any point in time because it's pretty unlikely anything disappears without you noticing it's gone. So there are systems, systems that work perfectly well. For most businesses, the system that's going to be far more cost efficient is the system in green. And what we recognize here is that at the end of the period, I'll switch back to green, at the end of the period, you physically count what inventory is there, and then you use that to reduce your actual cost of sales. Okay, now that makes absolutely heaps of sense, and what we're gonna do is therefore do our, costing, our cost of sales calculation, the method that we've got on screen, if I jump ahead, you have these notes here, 
which is to say at the end of the period we go off and we physically count our inventory and for example what we've got here at the end of this period inventory remains in stock we work out how much the items actually cost us and then we create this double entry journal here which is we recognize an inventory asset and we say credit cost of sales because we've initially recognized purchases as being the full cost of sale now let's take a look at what we've got down here okay imagine this is the first period we've said okay we've got no opening inventory in this scenario we had purchases at a cost of ten thousand dollars and we had closing inventory that we don't get from the accounting system itself in the first instance. We go get that by actually physically counting inventory and putting through that journal to treat it basically as a kind of a prepayment because we're saying we've paid this, but actually we've not yet matched it to a sale. Cost of sales is, as the name implies, the cost of the sales we've actually made. So any inventory we've purchased that we haven't actually sold should be taken out of cost of sales, which is what we're doing here. Okay, the next period... If we're working on the assumption that we sell our oldest inventory first, that's the underlying assumption in international accounting standards, different incidentally in the United States where they presume something slightly different to that. Uh, but here we're assuming that things get sold first. Apologies. The next year what we're going to do is have the following period, that closing inventory is going to become an expense. Whatever our purchases are that period, we add and then we deduct the amount of those purchases that actually we discover are still physically on the shelves. Instantly, imagine that, for example, here, you bought 10,000 and you got 10,000 units. Let's say each unit costs $1, and you've managed to sell 9,000. Okay, well, you'd expect to have 1,000 left over. If you discover that there's 800, well, that basically that is therefore going to logically include the cost of normal stock shrinkage, stock losses. And that's okay, because if you're a retailer, you expect a certain number of your uh, inventory to disappear. It's just factored into your general company's price, your general pricing. Okay, so there are two double entry journals in the simplified system of accounting that we use for inventory, and we only do it as an end of period adjustment. What we do is record the year end inventory, which is what we've done here, and then we reverse out that at the start of the next period, because the next period, okay, highlighting the fact this is the start of the next period. So it's kind of the first thing that you do each period. You say that opening inventory is going to become an expense this period. Let's just write it off now. So we say credit asset to get rid of it and therefore debit cost of sales. The easiest way of doing this is to know this working at the bottom of the screen here. This is relatively intuitive to most people, I think, that you, your cost of sales is you use up your opening inventory first, then you buy some more inventory, and then at the end of the period you go off and you count how much of that hasn't been sold yet that must be an asset because it's not yet an expense and then we put that figure through so if you can remember this journal here sorry this calculation here then all we need to do is go and work back from that to how we achieve that in double entry terms it does seem a little strange at first but I think the way to study this is to realize that it's basically a simplification if you're happy doing it in two stages if I just go back to what we have on screen here the thing they've got on blue okay that makes sense um, in double entry terms it's okay but it's an awful lot of work and it will always tell you you've got inventory more than you actually have because it's simply making this frankly completely unrealistic assumption that all of your units of inventory that are not sales will still be there at the end of the year no they won't some are in school children's pockets that they've nicked without uh, telling you okay it's much better really I would suggest to work on the system here in green my experience is most companies do and that is the assumption that you can use in the exam. Okay, You won't get kind of any other credit by trying to do it any other system. In fact, it's going to take up time and probably lose you time.